Focus Humanitarian Assistance USA is celebrating 25 years of international humanitarian and emergency response. Focus has shown real leadership when it comes to disaster risk reduction, developing resilient communities, and supporting climate change action in the Aga Khan Development Network. It's my pleasure to introduce a wonderful panel here today, Al-Karim Aladina, President of the National Council for the United States. He lives in Washington, DC. Honor Rule, General Manager of the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat. He lives in Geneva, Switzerland. Shanila Momin, the Chairperson of the Focus Board for the United States, who lives in Houston, Texas. And Shaquille Hirji, the Focus Global Coordinator, who's joining us from Ottawa in Canada. It's so wonderful to have all of you join us here today. Al Karim, good to see you. What an amazing moment, 25 years of Focus Humanitarian Assistance. We're all so proud of the work that, that has been done over the years. What's your biggest accomplishment when you look back? Well, thank you, Zane. First of all, I, I do echo your sentiments uh, of congratulations uh, for an incredible achievement of 25 years to the wonderful volunteers and staff that have dedicated themselves to this organization. Uh, of course, there are many accomplishments. If you were to ask me the one that sort of stands out as the president of the council from a Jamaati perspective, in the United States, you know, we are subject to every kind of a natural disaster you can think of, wildfires, to earthquakes, to hurricanes, right? And I think the, uh, I feel like the, the most, the greatest accomplishment for focus has been the ability to train and the volunteers so that they're able to prepare the Jamaat and make sure that they're well protected to any kind of natural disaster. Uh, I can't tell you how much I look forward, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, to get that text message anytime something's going on to say, hey, here's what you need to do to keep yourself and your family safe, right? I think those are little things, but they're a major accomplishment for the Jamaat to be able to make sure that it's well protected and secure. Ono, what are you most proud of? Well, um, I have to say, I'm, I've only started working um, since four years because that's when the Agri-Can Agency for Habitat took over focuses programs in South and Central Asia. So w what I'm proud of is I can actually talk about the accomplishments of ACA, as we call ACA, and what I'm actually talking about is what Focus has built over 25 years. So to give an example, in 2,307 communities in South and Central Asia have been mapped by us based on Focus's work for the disaster risk. Not only do we have maps, the people in those villages understand those maps. They know whether their house is safe or not. When the volunteers come to their house and they say an avalanche is coming, they know whether they're one of the ones who need to evacuate or not, and they actually evacuate. Nothing like, I'll ride out the hurricane with my six pack as they do in the United States sometimes. They actually respond. This is a level of mobilization that is just unbelievable. And it's in some of the toughest environments in the world. So, uh, you know, my job's easy. I just tell the story, but it's the work of focus that I'm writing on. Shanila, what story about focus do you tell? Well, um, you know, we've come a long way in the last 25 years. And um, not only have we been very active in, um, you know, in various parts of the world, as uh, Ono just mentioned. But uh, we've also been active. I think COVID pandemic was something that nobody expected, right? It just came to us and life just all of a sudden stopped. And what really uh, happened was that we were able to test focus uh, with uh, their emergency response and with the tools that we've provided just in, in, in the US. Uh, we set up a quick cluster management system where we had all the volunteers touch every Jamaati member, call Jamaati members because now we don't have Jamaat Khanas anymore. Uh, they were stopped for a while. And so how do we get to the Jamaat? So this was a great opportunity to create relationships to make sure that every Ismaili in the USA is doing well, their families are doing well and identify those who needed help. So I think that was that was one of the best things that have come up uh, just recently. Uh, our, I would say one of our greatest accomplishments in the U.S. What about you, Shaquille? You're the Focus Global Coordinator. When you look at the work done around the world, uh, what is it that strikes you most? Well, Zane, I mean, I think for me, um, it, it, a matter of pride has really been the 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 expansion of the work that FOCUS has undertaken in the last 25 years. 
it's quite incredible when you think about the fact that, you know, some 25 plus years ago, uh, we were in, you know, Focus was involved in providing humanitarian aid uh, to communities that had sort of been affected in Tajikistan, Afghanistan, due to the Soviet, uh, you know, breakup and their, their, their departure from Afghanistan. And then moving along that sort of pathway into um, the uh, Afghan refugee crisis, which not only included managing the refugee centers in Pakistan, but the resettlement of over 6,000 members of the Jamaat in Canada. And then the repatriation of over 40,000 people back to Afghanistan when, you know, when, when peace returned um, to Afghanistan, or at least when the civil war was done. Um, and then you start looking at this whole aspect of dealing with natural disasters and how the emergency management component of focus is work so extended out to that level. And then the, the last bit uh, four years ago, when the mandate got expanded even further with the, um, you know, with the uh, establishment of the Al Khan Agency for Habitat and how focus's work was going to be built upon in these areas to become more habitat centric, which is a fantastic approach and I'm sure you'll hear more about that from ONO as we go forward. So this expansion of focus over the 25 years has been very, very incredible to watch. Well, ONO, why, why don't you uh, drill down on that point a little bit, the, the, the habitat focus and help us understand that part of the evolution? Well, this is really a great story about the vision of His Highness Aga Khan. He understood the, the, how the work was great, but he also observed how the actual risk and the frequency of occurrence of natural disaster, especially in the high mountains of South and Central Asia, Himalayas, Karakor, and Pamir Mountains, um, got worse and worse. And of course, at the time he was talking about increased risk. Now, a little bit later, because he started talking about this decades ago, everybody knows that this is caused by climate change. Mm -hmm. And he said, and Shaquille tells this story beautifully at some point during a meeting, I think we need to integrate the work of focus in the work of the agency for habitat. The people were very surprised. He already understood at that moment that the skills that focus had developed, that mapping that, I'm talk that I talked about, the, the fact that we have ge geologists and scientists who work and that we know how to work with satellite data, we use those for humanitarian relief. But in fact, when you face more risk, you need to go beyond that and say, rather than only focusing on having people survive, we also focus on where those people put their homes in the future, where you build the Jamaat Kana, where you build the health center, where you build the school, the road, the bridge, you get the idea. And, 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 there, and, and actually, you need the same skills because the same data that we use for risk mapping, we can use for planning of the communities. So the way uh, His Highness put it beautifully one day, he said, we should no longer just map risks so that people can survive, obviously a beautiful goal, but we should actually use that data to make sure that people thrive. And that's the concept of the habitat. That's amazing. Um, you know, I don't want any of you to be upset with me, <laughs> but I didn't know that, that that was such a central part of, uh, of the work that you're doing, which speaks to Shaquille's point about the evolution um, you don't often associate the kind of work uh, that we do, or at least there's a lack of awareness perhaps about the mapping and the satellite and the real data-driven uh, technology, technology that drives the decision-making. So um, actually maybe we can get into that a little bit more uh, to understand the way that you do the risk mapping. I think our audience might find it quite compelling. Uh, uh, Al-Karim, what, what do you think has been the greatest challenge from what you see over the last 25 years? And, how do you think it's been overcome successfully? So uh, a difficult question to answer in that regard. Uh, but I, I would say, I guess maybe uh, the challenge, and I think we are overcoming it, is perhaps uh, in the area of uh, leveraging the partnerships and relationships that we potentially have in the United States. I'll speak more from a domestic perspective. Yeah. Uh, and, and try to leverage that knowledge uh, and, and, and share it uh, globally, right? So, uh, and I think we are doing some work in that area better, uh, leveraging the agreements of cooperation that we have and the partnership that we've been able to form, for example, uh, between Focus USA and the Alcan Agency for Habitat and the California Office of Emergency Services, right? Uh, to be able to, to tap into the expertise and the human resources that exist there uh, that allow us uh, to be able to use uh, best practices uh, abroad, 
right? And I know Ono was involved in some of those conversations, so I don't know if Ono would wish to add uh, some thoughts uh, yeah. to his, his engagement with Cal OES. Yeah, we, oh, Ono, just, uh, I just want to give uh, Shanila a chance to, to, to add here uh, on best practices uh, that uh, you, you alluded to there. What, what do you think has been, have been some of the best practices that Focus has adopted or from what you, from your vantage point, uh, have seen here in, in the United States from Houston? So I think that um, it's an evolution as far as the best practices, right? So as, as we are developing, as the world is changing and coming closer, we, we're learning a lot of new best practices. Uh, currently, we were reach, uh, FEMA reached out to us to ask us to join uh, as an organization. They have a volunteer organization called VOAD. We had a meeting. And it was amazing. They have um, all these resources available. So we, as President mentioned, you know the challenges that we've we faced uh, of leveraging ourselves. I think we're slowly uh, being able to move forward. And um, so I think that even with VOAD, they were familiar with our work with Cal OES that uh, in California with our MOU that we have. So I think that um, we've uh, we've started to get to the point where we're making these connections, public and private, which is giving us the ability to have or learn the best practices of emergency management. And I think we're beginning to touch the surface even now domestically. Uh, ono, what are your thoughts uh, on some of what you've heard? And just as a reminder, uh, both Shanila and uh, Al Karim had mentioned best practices of emergency management and have wanted you to weigh in on that. So uh, just lead us through how, how we should be thinking through certain things around that and, and what you've just said. Right, so, 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 so first on best practices and, 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 and uh, MOU with uh, California Office of Emergency Services, we're really proud of that. And, and we could have never had such a collaboration if we didn't have Focus USA as a partner. It's really important to emphasize that. What do they give us? Well, emergency management, it's a little bit like the army, right? Um, people need to respond according to protocols. They need to be trained. They need to do exactly the right thing from an ethical and from an operational perspective. And therefore, we have a vast training program. We need to train our volunteers on the ground. There's 23,000 of them. Our entire team, there's a thousand of them. Then uh, members of other Aga Khan agencies, especially the health services, but others also who participate we need to even train the famous helicopter pilots because they need to know what to do when they're not flying some, some ambassador, but they're actually flying in an emergency. It's a different ball game. Right. And we need to train the decision makers in the Aga Khan Development Network so that when there is an emergency, they take decisions on an immediate basis. This is, sounds trivial, but really important. Cal OES is helping out with that and they're doing great. Um, we, by the way, never have a partnership where we only take, we also give. So we ask them, what do you want from us? And what they like from us is what I talked about. The fact that when we raise awareness in communities, and when I say we, it's the work of Focus that I'm talking about, because Focus prepared those communities for all those years. When we raise awareness, people actually respond and respect. That's partly because of the Ismaili community, but not everybody in these areas, of course, is Ismaili, but it's significantly because of the quality of the engagement. And they're very keen to learn from, from us. We have a similar partnership in Canada. There they want to learn from us because of what we've learned about avalanche mapping, where we've really advanced a lot. So, so, so these are just a few examples. Um, I think otherwise, if I can do an anecdote about working in difficult places and, 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 and in controversy, <clears throat> Syria is one, Afghanistan, of course, is another. And it is not a secret that in Afghanistan, not all areas are controlled by the government of Afghanistan. Some of them are uh, controlled by what, what one calls AOGs. Most people at home would call that the Taliban. And um, when I had a session with the Youth and Sports Board in Paris, and we did a working session on how to work in Afghanistan, I said, what about the Taliban? They said, oh, well, obviously you don't talk to them. You can't talk to them, they're bad. And I said, well, they may be bad, but they control some of the communities in which our beneficiaries live. We need to work with them and we need to figure out a way to save those people from disaster risk as well. It means we talk to them. 
So to give an example, we need to be able to communicate with the villages. We used in the past uh, satellite phones, Guraya, as many people know them. Not very reliable, extremely expensive. And if you put one in the hand of somebody in Taliban territory, they will think you're actually a security threat because if you have a sat phone, you must be a spy or something like that. So rather than not talk to the Taliban and have them take away the Guraya's, we worked with them on developing a low-tech communication solution together with Roshan, the cell phone company in Afghanistan that is part of the Aga Khan Development Network, so that we wouldn't just deliver emergency communication, it would be low-tech, and people could also call their families using the same communication solution because there wasn't a cell phone network yet. What's the twist? The Taliban also want to call their family, so they were happy to allow us to do it. And that's an example of real time. And Shaquille knows this is super recent. We've just broken this deal, brokered this deal. Um, it, it, it's just, it, it, it's just. I mean, frankly, it's great fun to do work like that, although a little bit edgy. I, I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us. It's always the, the, the simple human things that can break the hardest uh, political, uh, ethnic uh, barriers sometimes. And the community obviously is, is playing a big part on the ground. And I wonder, uh, Shanila, when you look at that, you look at uh, the kind of work that you do, the, the, the importance of our community in, in the entire focus uh, operation. Uh, what is it that you see? What have been some of the, the simple things that, uh, that, you've, that you've been surprised by or that you've been wowed by or that you admire? Well, I think that the biggest thing that I see is that I'm surprised by is the the generosity of our volunteers and our donors. Um, the the Smiley community is very generous, and whenever we've called upon them for any emergency, whether it's in the U.S. or whether it's outside, whether it's to support our work with ACA or with other organizations, they've been more than generous. Uh, even the volunteers. So I, I think that that surprises me because I did, it's just, you know that they're going to pull through. So whenever our, our institutions need anything, if uh, Ono needs something, if, if Shaquille asks, we're able to provide it. So I think the support that we're able to provide has been something that's, uh, it's, it shouldn't be surprising, but it is that, uh, that, that we've been able to pull through in all sorts of um, matters. And one matter, Shanila, is, you know, I, I, I never want to uh, get away from looking at whether it's the pandemic or humanitarian assistance overall through a gender lens. And um, I and I want to ask uh, our, our other colleagues here as well. Um, what do you think FOCUS does best when it comes to focusing on women and women and girls uh, in, the, in the vision and mission that it has? Well, I think that it's, it's part of, uh, you know, the whole scheme or the whole idea that Hazim Mom has, right? It's something that we've been learning, uh, you know, since Hazim Mom's had schools for girls uh, and, uh, you know, in, in Africa to other parts of the U.S. And uh, women and girls' roles have become very, uh, I think, essential in our institutions. And same thing with focus. I think that um, providing the... Uh, the support, um, you know, one of the organizations that we're assisting with is the Diamond Jubilee Trust in India. That's one of the oldest uh, organizations. Uh, Hazrat uh, Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah is the one who established it in 1946. And it actually has uh, schools for girls. So it uh, oversees schools and now we're providing them assistance during the COVID pandemic uh, for food, shelter and, and the essentials. But I think that it all goes hand in hand. Um, if we're able to support our communities, we're able to bring them up together, whether they be girl, women or, or men. But it seems that women's roles have changed a lot, even in our institutions. Uh, women have become um, in much more higher positions than we were earlier. So I think that uh, women's roles are slowly moving up. And al Karim, May I yeah. then? May, may yeah, I say something about gender? And, uh, so first of all, two out of, the, two out of the five CEOs we have are women, and um, I hope soon it'll be three out of the five, but I don't want to fire any of the men. Five out of the five, oh no. Uh, <laughs> what are you talking about? No, 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 well, there, 
um, I'm actually all for that, but we have to, uh, you know, respect contract duration. But but here's the cool story. You talked about these uh, in, in the introduction. You said about these certs, the community emergency response teams. These are the 23,000 volunteers that we have in 1,800 villages all across these mountainous areas, including in Afghanistan. Well, almost 50%. Uh, it's 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 well above 45% of these volunteers are women. They're women between the age of 18 and 26, typically. Imagine that you're in Afghanistan in a remote rural community where the role of women is very different than it ought to be. And you're a volunteer, you got a uniform, you wear a hard hat like everybody. You have a, a real task. It's an incredible empowerment. These women do the best work. They impress and our donors in the beginning wouldn't believe we had women doing this work in Afghanistan. And of course, they couldn't go to the field because donors in Afghanistan don't go to the field. So we actually brought the volunteers for training sessions so that our donors could see that we actually are women. Now, what's the beautiful story? After a stint as volunteer, many of these women have gone on to leadership positions in the community. This is not surprising to you or any of us, but it is a revelation in the context in which these women were brought up and it's really changed. And we now have generations of these women because this is not new, but we're keeping going on it. And, and it's a tremendous source of empowerment. And if I may say, since I'm the non-Ismaili on the group, what, uh, what Chair Shanila said about always giving, always being there, always volunteering, you know, I wish my community was like that. It's really unbelievable. And I can say that from the bottom of my heart because I see it, I benefit from it professionally. It's an unbelievably powerful thing about the Ismaili community and admire it greatly and I'm very grateful for it. Thank you, Anna. That's We appreciate that. That's that's really kind of you. Thank you. Um, Al-Karim, your thoughts and any additional observations you have in your in your current role, uh, given as given your reflections yeah. on this day? Yeah, so, so, so I would also then first then echo uh, our appreciation to Ono for his very kind comments about the Ismaili community. It's, it's very nice. And, very generous of you. Um, so, um, you know, Zane, I do echo everything that has been said about the, the, the role of women and what, what has happened, but I, I would like to just make one point, and, and I know we all mean this, but sometimes it's better to just say it, that the, that the roles that the young uh, ladies or the women and, and, and people that, that they hold are there because they're, not because they're female, they, are, they, are, they hold those roles because of the, the merit and competency with which they're able to execute on the task. And so I think it's very important that we recognize that, that there, you know, and I, in all fairness, uh, that that's the reason why. And, 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 and you know, and Chairman Chenila is a prime example of, of that in, in leading uh, this uh, organization in the United States and her predecessor was similarly situated. Uh, and then that was because of, of you know, the, you, you want to bring the best people into these organizations. And it is wonderful uh, to see that. And I see that that growing. And I do see that also in the United States, Jamaat, as what uh, Ono is describing in terms of other areas. We see that in the United States in terms of the volunteers that are there. There's, there's males and yeah. females that are there that are supporting the Jamaat. Okay. The only other thing I would add, if I may, is, you know, Shanelle was talking about the incredible generosity of the United States Jamaat, which is true, and we are there to support the global Jamaat. But I think that through COVID, uh, we have been able to also demonstrate uh, in, in the general population in the United States, the generosity and the desire for the amount of institutions, which includes Focus USA, to work for the improvement of the quality of life of all people in the communities that we live, you know, whether it's through, you know, food or donations of masks and so on, or everything related to helping to, to protect people, to help people, which is part of humanitarian assistance, right? And so I think it's important to know that we're beginning to see that. And this is, that's one of the positive unintended consequences of COVID, uh, I think has been that, that opportunity in the United States to be able to showcase what capacity focus has and what can bring uh, to the table. Right. Thank you. Well, one final question for everyone. Shaquille, I'll, I'll start with you. What do you think is the one thing that you have learned uh, in the last 25 years looking at focus? And where do you want to see the next 25 years go? Well, looking back, I mean, I think one of the things that, uh, that has been very heartening for me has just been the engagement of the community um, that, that we serve, that we work with, that supports the work that we do. You know, when, you, when you look at an area, and 
some of you might have had the opportunity to do so. But if you look at areas that I have sort of traveled in, in, this, in, this, in this role, and places like Tajikistan and the mountainous areas, and you, and you look at this valley that is probably no more than, you know, 100 meters in, 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 in width. And there exists a river that runs through it, and then people living on either side of it. And you ask yourself, how does one even survive in, in something like this? And yet the communities are very hopeful uh, because with the support and the training uh, and, the, and the ongoing guidance that they receive and their own involvement and ownership of making sure that their communities remain safe and resilient, it, it's just so heartening to see that. And as I look back and, and continue to look forward, this is what's going to carry us out. And whether it's a community in the USA that is providing of resources to be able to do the work to a community in Tajikistan. This community involvement aspect of it for me has been, has been fascinating. It's just, uh, it's very heartening uh, to see. And I think going forward, uh, we're beginning to see, or at least I, from my point of view, we're beginning to see a lot of new technologies. We all talked about sort of, uh, you know, best standards being brought into the work that we're doing. And that has suddenly moved this needle um, you know, much, much more than anything else that I can think of. So I'm, I'm extremely optimistic uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in, in looking forward with, with everything that's going on. Thank you. Shanila, what have you learned and where would you like to see Focus go? So, you know, I think that um, when I first started off at Focus, I just, the stories I heard from Ono and from Shaquille, they just really, they pull at your heartstrings. You, you realize that, uh, and you're so grateful that you were part of a community that cares, right? That even though we're here in the US and we are making such a difference to our own uh, Jamaati members and their communities and humanity at large, uh, way across the world, right? On the other side in mountainous regions, the fact of, you know, in Tajikistan, the work in the mountainous areas uh, and that's all because of something that we do here and how we can impact someone that lives so far off. And that's just so amazing. I think that uh, just makes me feel so good about being part of Focus and being part of our institutions. And uh, thank you, Ono, for the wonderful words about the Smiley community. Um, what, as far as the goals, um, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see that Focus build upon our current agreements and um, establish strong public and private uh, partnerships. So that we, and this could be for all, it's just not for focus in the USA or, but all over the world, we can access resources that are available based on these relationships and also leverage Focus USA as a disaster management and preparedness agency for the wider community. Uh, so we can exchange knowledge of best practices in emergency management, because certainly we're, we know what we're doing, but it's always good to have better ideas, right? And being part of these bigger uh, organizations, like I just mentioned, VOAD uh, or Cal OES, we, it brings us more information and resources and uh, learning that we can provide to the Jamaat and to our communities at large. Also, we wanna be a productive uh, partner in these agencies so that um, we can come together to do what our mission is, right? Uh, reduce suffering and save lives in the greater community. So I think that's our goal is to how do we move forward and make a greater impact in the world, not just for us Somalis, but the communities that we live in. Thank you. Uh, ono, uh, a big takeaway for us and a vision for the next 25 years. Well, the big takeaway, like Shaquille, is, is you imagine that valley and then you realize that this community didn't give up on people living in this valley, actually mobilized across the world to help these people be able to survive on their own strength because they mobilize themselves. When the avalanche hits at night, nobody from Aka or Focus is there. It's the volunteers from the village who do the work. So that's, that's what surprised me and made me want this job, frankly, because it's just such an amazing thing to build on. Now, what's the vision? The vision is embodied in Akka's global head of emergency management. She's a woman called Nusrat Nassab. She is from the mountains in Pakistan. She is from one of those villages that shouldn't exist. 
if other communities would, might have given up. She's also from the very first batch of the Aga Khan High School in Hunza. And she's now a global leader in the AKDN, very first batch. So she embodies to me how you lift a community out of poverty. Because if the girls in the community can achieve that, rather than live in a destitute village with no future, then the community will be lifted out of, heat, uh, out, of, out of poverty. So this concept of not just planning to survive, but planning to thrive. My vision is that every girl who is born in these geographies that we work about, harsh and threatened by climate change, will have the potential to develop herself like Nusra has and lift their family out of poverty. And that sounds idealistic, but it is actually possible with the intellectual capital that we have if we just keep believing and if we keep mobilizing. I really believe it, and we will deliver on this together. Thanks, Ono. Well said. Al Karim, final word. Oh, wow. Okay. So, first, Ono, <laughs> it's good to have incredible dreams and aspirations. That's how you achieve greatness. So, thank you for dreaming and aspiring for that. Again, I would say, Zane, I would just want to extend my congratulations to Focus for 25 incredible years and uh, to the, of course, the testament to the vision of the Ismaili Imamat, but really a testament to the commitment uh, of the volunteers and the professional staff that have worked with, uh, with Focus over all this time. And, and I say congratulations. I say thank you on behalf of the Jamaat uh, and uh, look forward to the next 25 years, if not more. Thank you very much, Al Karim Aladina, Ono Rul, Shanila Momin, and Shaquille Hirji. Thanks for the great work that you do, the effort that you make, the sacrifices you make, and the leadership that you show, especially navigating us through the very uh, new and, and difficult current economic and political environment uh, that we that we do. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it, and great to meet all of you. We never thought this would happen to us, but it did. When we came home, there was water in our basement, but some parts of Ellicott Sea were completely flooded. Our business property, one was so devastated that it really hit the ground. There was nothing left. When we heard the news report of how Hurricane Harvey making landfall in our area, we were told that we might need to evacuate. Yes, local authority did tell us to evacuate. National Guard assisted us in evacuation and we were evacuated by boat. Our house was flooded after Hurricane Harvey, about a foot of water, 12 inches of water, just below the power outlet um, came in our house. Uh, we had sheetrock damage, kitchen appliances were damaged, kitchen cabinet were damaged. Uh, it took us approximately six months to fix our house and come back to our, our regular routine. We never thought this would happen to us, but it did. As we in the United States and across the world grapple with the impact of COVID-19, natural disasters are still happening around us. We can take this opportunity to be prepared and protect ourselves and our families in the event of an emergency. Don't underestimate the power of uncertainty because we never know when we will face any uncertain climate or weather or any other situation, how it will happen, where it will happen. 
when it will happen, we never know. In the Western region, the natural disasters we experience are wildfires and earthquakes, so we always have to be prepared. The Saddle Ridge Fire began on the night of October 10th, 2019 in Silmar, California, which is about 12 miles from us. We received phone calls from family and friends at about 1.30 a.m. when the fire was about five miles away. Because we had our basic emergency kits ready, we were able to add a few items and load the car within 20 to 30 minutes. We left the house at 2 a.m., an hour before mandatory evacuations by the Los Angeles Police Department. We had 20 to 30 minutes to leave, so we added a few things to our personal emergency kits that we keep ready, close to the door and grab and go. We update these once a year, change our children's clothing to bigger sizes to be able to use for the next few years. We also update everyone's medications. We have seven day double pill boxes for each individual who has medication. We also have one four person and two two person emergency kits in all of the cars. Besides this, we also keep some older emergency kits in the house that we update from time to time. It took us a weekend to put together our personal emergency kits. Putting together an emergency kit is simple and easy. Anyone can do it easily. Natural disasters can happen anytime, anywhere, and affect anyone. Know what to do during a severe weather event or natural disaster. 